How can we learn from the past? It is a story that Americans are challenged with all the time. It's haunting, cruel, tragic, threatening, shocking, unbelievable, evil, illogical, xenophobic, genocide, danger, death. But that's not all there is to this story. How can we learn from the past? It is a story that Americans are challenged with all the time. It's haunting, cruel, tragic, threatening, shocking, unbelievable, evil, illogical, xenophobic, genocide, danger, death. But that's not all there is to this story. I think it was for many, many years a beckoning subject, uh, something we had to deal with, something we had to confront as filmmakers of American history. This is a story in which everyone is challenged all the time. We are challenged as Americans, we're challenged as parents, as children, to think about what we would have done, what we could have done, what we should have done. Even though the Holocaust physically took place in Europe, it is a story that Americans have to reckon with too. Why would we want to go back and look at this dark, dark time? But the opportunity to look at it through the perspective of what does it mean for America and Americans was an opportunity we just couldn't pass up. Part of our national mythology is that we are a good people, we are a democracy. And we are a democracy. And in our better moments, we are very good people. But that's not all there is to the story. We have interviews from scholars and writers who have studied the story, but there's just really nothing like speaking to someone who lived through it and hearing their story directly told to you. My father explained, if we're in two different places, the chance that two of us will survive is bigger. So that was the first time that I really realized it's a matter of life and death. These are important events in American history that need to be understood now and five years from now. Every generation deserves to look at the defining moments of the human experience and try to understand them for the present. This story is beyond our comprehension. It's horrifying. I won't work on a more important film in Hi, everybody. My name is Cynthia Hunt. I'm with the Amarillo Public Library. The film clips you've been watching while waiting for today's presentation to begin were taken from the new Ken Burns documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust, and I have been asked to say a few words about this documentary on behalf of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is honored that the Americans and the Holocaust exhibition inspired Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein to produce a new documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust. The film was produced solely by Florentine Films. Like the Americans and the Holocaust exhibition, the film explores what Americans knew about the persecution and murder of the Jews and how they responded. It will make an important contribution to our understanding of both Holocaust and American history. The museum was pleased to cooperate with the filmmakers by providing archival and historical sources and expertise in support of the film. Now, on to some housekeeping.
We are recording today's presentation for use later on the library's YouTube channel, so we ask that you please turn down the volume on your phones all the way, or better yet, turn them off completely so we don't get some amber alert in the middle of someone's presentation. Um, if you do get a call that you really must take, please answer with the two words, hold please, in a low volume, then go ahead and leave the room before you begin to talk to them. This will not only make the recording more enjoyable for viewers in the future, but will also be less distracting for both the audience and our presenters who are here today. Modern Perspectives on the Holocaust is a lecture series assembled by the Amarillo Public Library. Each of the presentations in this series has been carefully chosen by the library and then vetted by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and are designed to enhance and deepen your understanding of one or more of the themes contained within the Americans and the Holocaust Traveling Exhibition, which, are, which is currently being hosted at our downtown library. The Modern Perspectives on the Holocaust series has been made possible in part by Friends of the Amarillo Public Library, the Amarillo Civic Center Complex, Panhandle PBS, the American Library Association, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and Education Credit Union. Today's presentation, Learning Through History, Amarillo College Students Share Their Auschwitz and Birkenau Experiences, is being presented by a group of students from the Amarillo College Presidential Scholars Honor Program who went to Poland during their spring break earlier this year to visit Holocaust-related sites in Western Poland. I hope you will give them a warm welcome. First, we'll be hearing from the Honors Program Chair, Leslie Ingham. Hi everyone, boy have we had an adventure. The Amarillo College Presidential Scholars Program is a small group of 15 students who are recruited during their uh, senior year of high school. They are chosen through an application and interview process and since spots are limited, it gets competitive, especially when they find out that the, an all expenses paid international trip is involved, as you can imagine. In March of 2020, our dreams of traveling to Poland to study the Holocaust and experience the beautiful Polish culture were crushed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Spring of 2021 honestly didn't look much better. And finally, we were able to go ahead with our planning for March 2022. We kept our promise to our former honor students and we offered the trip to all three classes, the 2021 and 22 class combined classes combined. Exactly two weeks before we were to depart, however, Russia invaded Ukraine, quickly escalating the conflict that had been ongoing since 2014. Goodness, what a blow that was to hear. Several students withdrew from the trip, either because their parents were nervous about the next door war, understandably so, or they themselves were nervous. The leaders, including myself and the AC president and his cabinet, were certain that the trip would be canceled. However, our contacts on the ground in Poland stressed that it was business as usual. So we proceeded. After several backing out and extensive and stressful COVID testing, testing again, worries about losing our vaccine cards, passports, and any other important belongings, we finally were boarding the bus to Denver, where 30, 31 of us would fly to Krakow for our long-awaited trip to the stunningly gorgeous city. We stayed in Krakow for most of the trip with a two-night stay in Oswinshim, where we visited the sites of approximately one million deaths during the Holocaust. A few of my Poland travelers are joining us today from all walks of life to tell you what they saw, what they felt, and how it affects them. Each student will state their first and last name and then proceed with their stories. You're going to see a running slideshow here with images that we took while on the trip, so please jot down a description of any photo you have a question about, and we will do our best to find it later after the program and answer any questions you might have. And for that matter, um, jot down questions you have for our speakers as well, because there will be a brief Q&A after the whole program is finished. Please help me welcome the AC Presidential Scholars. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. 
So I am Connor Barrera, and I am currently a WT student with a major in computer science. So for me, and I'm pretty sure for a lot of the students that are currently behind me right now, most of what we learn about the Holocaust and World War II, we learned in school. In history class, we went over the grand importance of the different events, like battles and major historical landmarks. Um, in English, we're usually assigned to read books like Knight and Schindler's List. And occasionally, there will be a movie that comes out that really um, jives with us, like um, The Boy in Striped Pajamas. And I would say that's usually the extent of what we know. But I do feel with that material, there's a certain level of disconnect that you have with that. Like, you understand that the movie, there are actors that are reenacting a scene, but are not actually experiencing it. With books and movies, it's always a event that happened a long time ago in some other place far, far away. But for me personally, that changed when we went to Poland and I was in Auschwitz and I was in front of the display where hundreds and hundreds of suitcases were stacked on the floor. Because at that moment, I realized what those suitcases were. They were what was left of people who had been slaughtered for their material and treated as nothing more than cattle. They were taken from their homes, took whatever they could, put it in those suitcases, and never came back. And to be honest, that weight never really sunk in with me until I saw those because when you're there, you can physically see those suitcases. They are in front of you. They are real in a way that is hard to imagine. And to be honest, another disturbing realization came once I saw those suitcases. Because those Nazis, they didn't just see the suitcases. They literally saw those people that were holding those things and did not care about them as people. They made snap decisions on whether those people would be used as slave labor until they dropped dead, or if they were even worth the time and would just be killed because they didn't think they could be used well. And even in a more disturbing case, some of those people were literally turned into commodities, like lampshades, rope, and soap. They could not see those people as anything more than raw material or worthless. And it is a disturbing thought that haunts me now that people can do stuff like this. And I personally, if whenever the whole thing with Russia and Ukraine settles down and it feels safer to go to Poland, I would highly encourage anyone who can to go there because there is a certain weight that will be impossible for me or anyone else to describe that can only be experienced the second you are in front of that glass and see those suitcases for yourself. Thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Aaron Gilgarin, and I'm a nursing student for AC, and I'll be graduating in December of this year. Yay! <laughs> so, my memories of Poland were bright and joyful. I made a lot of new friends and experienced a new, totally different culture. All in all, it was great, but a part of me felt a very heavy burden. It was this inner anguish and feelings of frustration that made me just feel helpless and weak. Childhood memories. Memories. Childhood. They give us a reflection of our past. It's a very important part of every person's life, one that must be cherished and remembered forever. Because once it's gone, we can't bring it back. Life is so precious and must be cherished. It's not something easily taken. Childhood embodies the fond memories when growing up and entering. 
And upon entering Auschwitz and Birkenau, it took all of that from the children. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, only six to 11% of Europe's pre-war Jewish population of children survive as compared to 33% with adults. To think children were separated from their families only to realize it was their last chance to ever see them again. Entering Birkenau, you get that emergent feeling of happiness just not found there. Only death lingers and that aura seeps into the air. The troubling and extreme conditions day in and day out, out of forced labor given minimal food and stack wooden beds, rows and rows of them. Children drawing on the walls with horrific drawings that I cannot or want to explain. <laughs> I can barely imagine the struggle they had to go through, the lives missed. The future is unforeseeable. These children were stolen from their lives. Faced with brick walls, cold, harsh conditions every day, cage up in these camps, they felt vulnerable. Adults had themselves and were given a glimpse of hope, a way to cope up and hold up those hope. But these children need to grow and enjoy. Coming back to the States, I continued my day as usual, but there are nights where I'd wake up from nightmares and suddenly filled with tears, reminded of the horrors that occurred in Birkenau and Auschwitz. I walk their steps and follow their journey there, and all can be seen in the remnants of what's left. As a nursing student, I walk into the steps of the hospital and stop and pray for another day given. I learn to appreciate the value of life even deeper than I anticipated. I have taken, patients as taken care of patients as young as the moment they were born and have witnessed a soul's last dying breath. I move forward every day because it is the smiles and cries of joy when talking to them. Give me that energy. Reminding me to thank every day that life is precious and more than words can simply express it. On our journey, we encountered refugee children from Ukraine who was staying in a room next door. Besides this door, we met a Holocaust survivor. Meeting the survivor, at the time of the war, she was a mere child. And now she lives at the age of over 80. Imagine the lives we have missed. She told us about the images as well as the sounds that she still hears. She had lived through the era that no one wants to remember. She showed us her tattoo and the meaning it was for her. That one thing about her speech that struck me immensely was the fact that when she was a child, she decided to keep her memories alive. She persevered so that history could never be forgotten. She said, I want you to listen. What cannot be changed, but it's up to you, the next generation and the next one after. And that's why I'm here today to share my story so you would take this message and never forget this tragedy. Thank you. Hello, my name is Noah Sawyer. I'm a mechanical engineering student at West Texas A&M. And just this past summer, I graduated from AC with two associates in science. I've always been fascinated with history, especially World War II. I've always been uh, learning, fascinated with learning about times in history like that, that uh, affect our world. Through learning about reading books, watching movies, uh, you, you learn about Auschwitz and Birkenau. But actually walking there, there's no, there's, there, there's nothing like it about gaining that real experience of walking through that space that, that those millions walk through. You, you, you see buildings made of bricks 
railroads made of iron in, in an atmosphere made of the same stuff that we have here in Amarillo. There's just nothing like it. Even though we are 5,500 miles away from the city of, of Oswekim, we still have we still have dirt and mud, and we can walk out, breathe the same air, see the sun and moon, and it it's all the exact same thing. But even still, here we do not have the history that that place has. We are not individuals that survived that place. We got an interesting perspective while we were at Auschwitz Birkenau. Be, because we went during the war, during the current war of Russia in Ukraine. A Spanish philosopher named George Satana uh, wrote a, ser a volume of books called The Life of Reason. And in that, he, he has said the quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We see that here today with how Russia is attacking Ukraine. And we can hear that and you can see in history that has happened before, but actually living through it and walking through a space that happened in the past and now hearing on the news and being there in a neighboring country, there's just nothing like it. Well, at Birkenau, they, they created a monument, the International Monument of Victims of Fascism. While, while I was there, I focused on the floor. The floor of this monument was created of millions of individual square bricks, all different just because of how they're cut. But still, they all work together to create a magnificent monument to represent the horrific actions that happened there. We should be able to work together like this monument does. We do not need to be focused on hate or, or being rude. We should always lift people up and bring them together. We should always be able to raise each other up. Hello, my name is Brianna Gordo and you may be wondering what I have to say about the Holocaust. Growing up in Amarillo, I learned about this horrible event in history from fiction books we covered about a day or two in class. But in May of 2020, 20, wait, sorry, but in May of 2022, thanks to Amarillo College, I was able to visit both Auschwitz and Birkenau. Today, I will be sharing with you the same emotions I felt there and the impact that seeing the side of history had on me arriving at Auschwitz. One by one, we stepped off the bus, and one after the other, I noticed that we were all dressed alike. I looked down to observe myself. I had on, one, a long sleeve shirt, two, pants with no holes, three, a pair of comfortable boots, four, a coat, five, gloves, and six, a scarf. When I looked back up to a clear sky, I was quickly reminded that it was not winter. I was wearing six more clothing items than the Holocaust victims had on even the coldest of days. As we made our way to the front of the building, we were given a radio and headphones to listen to our guides. We were then directed back outside to a concreted area. In front of us stood the Auschwitz sign. I couldn't help but feel sick knowing I was going to willingly walk in and out of that entrance when it was not always that simple. Our tour begins. Number one, the rocks. Going down the concrete stairs of the building, lining our pathway to the entrance were rocks. The sound of stepping on the rocks is a sound that is impossible to forget. Even with someone speaking directly into my ears, the crunching of the rocks were even louder. And the reason I bring up the rock pathway is to point out the overwhelming emotions that take complete control over you when you experience a place like Auschwitz. When the rocks, with the rocks drowning out every other sense, all I can think about were the poor souls being brought to their death, how my fear was trivial compared to theirs. 
So much so that the rock sound is no longer just rocks scraping one another, but is the exact same sounds that thousands have heard right before they were horrifically murdered. I remember closing my eyes and hearing the weight of my footsteps as I approached the entrance. Number two, the windows. The second thing I would like to talk about are the windows of the 28 two-story buildings. Why the windows? This is because the camp was originally the barracks for the Polish army. Then there only stood 20 buildings. And out of the 20 buildings, only six of them were two stories. Who made the others? The two-story additions to the 14 existing buildings and the eight new buildings were made by the prisoners themselves. Walking through the camp, you can clearly identify which buildings were added on or newly made because of the windows. The original windows are a lot wider and smaller in height compared to the ones placed by the prisoners. I stared a lot at the windows that were placed by the prisoners thinking what it would have been like to be on the other side. Number three, the pots and pans. The third thing I want to discuss is the room that holds all the pots and pans of the victims and the significance of these items. With the promise of relocation and a new life, the victims did not get much time to pack up all their belongings into a luggage or two. It was absolutely heart-wrenching to see the number of pots and pans that the families took. Heart-wrenching because these pots and pans showed me two things. That is hope and love. The pots and pans showed me hope because the victims believed that they would be placed somewhere humane enough to be able to cook, to be able to be left alive. The pots and pans showed me love because in all the chaos, these families knowing that there was such limited space to pack, decided to use this space in order to feed their families. Each pot and pan represented someone, someone in their families, it represented a story. Number four, the book of names. At the end of our tour, we were directed to Block 27. Block 27 holds the books of names of all victims of the Holocaust, all known victims of the Holocaust. The length of a page is roughly the same height of my knee to the top of my head. There are over 16,000 pages in this book. Again, in every hope in trying to reconnect their identity, you find yourself wanting to read all 4.2 million names listed in the book. Because that is not possible, you open a page and read all the names you can. When doing this, I wondered how long it had been since another person had read the name that I had just read. I couldn't help but apologize to each individual's name for the atrocity and that was committed and the life they lost. Birkenau. Entering Birkenau, one of the first things you notice are the train tracks that transported the prisoners. They would be directed to go different directions depending on their physical appearance. You were either selected to enter the big building in the back of the camp or deemed useless and sent to the gas chambers. Those would be the only two possibilities. I will further explain the two paths that the prisoners took. Number five, the big building. The big building is where the prisoners were taken to strip their identities even further. Walking into the building, you're immediately standing in the same spot where the prisoners were forced to remove their clothing. You are then walking through a narrow hall, and on the right, you see what are many elevators that would then take their possessions away. The next stop is the area in which the shaving of their head took place. A required shower of each prisoner would then follow. After the process of disinfecting the prisoners was completed, they were thrown into a room where they would wait an unknown amount of time before they were taken to a separate room where they received a striped shirt and pants. In this room, there was a wall memorial of photos of victims' pictures of siblings playing outside, of a husband and wife with their newborn baby, P pictures of people playing their instrument, photos of grandparents, cousins, friends, and pets. These were all photos that you and I take of our loved ones. I could not even begin to comprehend the evilness that took place to disregard someone's basic human rights to completely violate their dignity. Number six, the pond. Being elderly, disabled, pregnant, a child, or holding a newborn baby are just some of the things that would deem you useless. Once you were labeled as useless, the last place you would see were the gas chambers. However, in an attempt to hide any evidence of the activities that went on during the camp, 
the chambers in Burke Canal were all destroyed. The last one, Crematorium 5, being destroyed just one day before liberation on January 26, 1945. All that remains now are bits and pieces of each in the exact same spot they once functioned in. Once we had reached Crematorium 4, we moved on to a small pond directly behind it. From a distance, the clear blue sky fooled me into thinking the pond was a deep blue color. It was only when I approached the pond I realized how grayish the water really was. The cruelness actions did not end after the victims lost their lives, but continued even after death. This pond is now a memorial site. There is an unknown amount of people's ashes that rest there. Four tombstones in different languages beside the pond read, the memory of the men, women, and children who fell victim to the Nazi genocide here lie their ashes. May their souls rest in peace. Today, I was able to share with you six things that had made an impact on my life. One, being the rocks. Two, the windows. Three, the pots and pans. Four, the book of names. Five, the big building. And six, the pond of ashes. This is six more experiences I get to share than the victims of the Holocaust do. Innocent people who were degraded and stripped of their lives people who experienced the living and death. These were ordinary people like you and I. It is important that we protect our history. That way, nobody is forgotten. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Fulton. I am a senior advertising and PR major at West Texas A&M. I started at Emerald College fall of 2019, where I later ob obtained my associate's degree in mass communications in May of 2021. I was part of the original Poland crew, the crew from 2019 to 2020, the group that poured our hearts and souls in preparation for a trip that was canceled a few days before takeoff. We had researched, presented, and even studied some Polish for six months to get ready to leave U.S. soil. However, COVID had other plans for us. The borders closed and the world shut down forcing us to isolate and Zoom call on what could have been the best spring break. Sadly, 2020 wasn't our year. I don't really think it was anyone's year. Um, but now, fast forward to March 2022, we finally got to take off. Now, we weren't quite the same group we were in 2020, but we had met some fellow students along the way. Poland was everything we could have imagined and more, from the people to gorgeous cathedrals and the odd but delicious food. We had finally made it. Now, this trip was not all fun and games. It was a learning excursion into World War II and the tragedy of the Holocaust. When studying the Holocaust in your high school history class or college textbook, it doesn't prepare you for the overwhelming grief and despair the death camps truly hold. We started off our journey into World War II at Auschwitz I. This is the camp famously known for the railroad-like gates that read Arbet macht frei, or the English translation, work makes one free. This sign was the first sign prisoners read as they marched into Auschwitz, a sign that gave them hope that it could all be over soon. However, they were mistaken. This camp was filled with a feeling of despair and sadness. As we walked building to building, the air felt cold and heavy. None of us were prepared for the sights or stories we were about to see. Now, let me paint a picture for you. Okay, it is a cloud and chilly morning, and you're walking through a pebble-paved walkway through a wooden railroad gate, and above you is the last sign of hope before you're separated from your friends, family, and loved ones. You were separated based on your sex, health, and strength. If you didn't meet the physical requirements, you were sent to death. If you met the requirements, your head was shaved, stripped of all your belongings, and thrown in thinly striped uniform with wooden shoes. Afterwards, you would be tattooed with your prisoner number. You slept in wooden bunks like sardines with nails poking out and little to no bedding inside brick buildings with no insulation or heating. You were starved, abused, and forced to do unnecessary labor. If you were a child, you'd be sent to the angel of death. Here, you'd experience inhumane experiments, and if you were a twin, they'd be agonizing and often lethal. If you fell behind or became ill at any point, you'd be taken out back and shot execution style in front of the other prisoners, as an example. 
When we toured Auschwitz I, we walked through what was once their living quarters. Now, those rooms are filled with their belongings. In one specific room, it's shoes. On display, there's a specific pair of shoes that are a pastel pink with bows. These were once worn by a happy child, a child whose childhood was stripped from her at the age of three. The next room was a room full of hair, all different textures, colors, and lengths. Those brown braids or golden locks were stripped from individuals who no longer had their own identity. This hair that was wrongly taken from them was used for profit for their gatekeepers. Now, the next few rooms were the hardest to bear. First was the room full of luggage. Now, this luggage contained belongings that families had only minutes to get before rushed into these camps. Belongings that they thought they could keep that were going to later be sold. Second was the hardest room for me to bear. It was full of prosthetics, back braces, and canes. Now I ask you, as a human, how could you bear stripping one's ability to walk or to have basic function? And they didn't really have a chance. There, when they were, had their leg taken away, they were seen as unusable and sent straight to death. Next was glasses. As someone who wears contacts, that's a basic way of your five senses. And there, those glasses were stripped, or any form of sight was stripped from these prisoners. Their five senses, one of their basic five senses was stripped from them. Lastly, there was a storage container full of pots and pans. Now, these pots and pans to me resembled a family or a mother who thought she could go and make a meal for her family. She didn't think that when she got there, her kids wouldn't be provided for or they would be starved. So those pit, pots and pans sit there as a reminder that these families never could provide for their family or love their family the way they wanted to. Now, all of that was just Auschwitz I. Birkenau was day two and 10 times the size and also had five running gas chambers. If you have seen any Holocaust documentaries or movies or pictures, you'll recognize the big brick watchtower that had two railroad tracks running through it. This was the end of the line for most prisoners. A day in the life of a Birkenau prisoner is one of the hardest, under, one of the hardest things to understand. They start off by arrival and selection. The physical journey to Birkenau consisted of thousands upon thousands of prisoners packed into train cars. Here, they would travel anywhere from a couple of hours to a few days. They had no room to sit, lay down, or eat. They couldn't even go to the bathroom. Since they were packed into these tiny cars and there was no windows or form of ventilation, it became difficult for most prisoners to breathe. Some didn't even make it to the actual camps. Once they reached their final destination, they waited in the cars for several hours before unloading themselves as well as their belongings. This is when the selection process began. They were separated women and men. At each side of the ramp was a Nazi doctor who decided who lived and who went straight to the gas chambers. Those who were pregnant, mothers to young children, children or elderly were sent straight to the gas chambers for the final resting place. Those who appeared strong or healthy enough to perform manual labor were sent straight to the sauna. The sauna is where prisoners would be stripped of all clothing and shaved from head to toe. They'd be thrown in a group of showers, given striped, striped uniforms and wooden clogs. Once they were done with the sanitation process, they were sent to quarantine, which is initially a wooden barrack with dirt floors filled with wooden bunks and a small fireplace. At this camp, their living situation were a bit harsher. Each bunk consisted of eight prisoners on each level. The bunks were one blanket and a thinly, thinly lined hay mattress. Nights were often frigid. For prisoners to stay warm, they would steal clothes off the deceased as an extra layer. However, having a deceased bunk mate also meant lack of body heat. If they had to use the facilities in the middle of the night, they would have to use a shared bucket, and the last one to fill up the bucket would have to empty it without getting in trouble. During the daytime, they had limited bathroom breaks. This was a time break in a facility block that had roughly 100 holes in a concrete rectangle where three prisoners were per hole. They were also starved. 
Food rations solely depended on your number in line. If you were first in line, you got water. If you were last in line, you probably didn't eat that day. Now, if you knew the server, you might have been lucky enough to get half a carrot or a piece of potato in your soup. While touring Birkenau, you began to wonder how they could survive these inhumane living conditions. Well, the answer solely depended on their jobs given or their fight for survival. Oddly enough, most sought out the job of toilets. While yes, they were in charge of being elbow deep in feces, they had a warm place to be in, the Nazi guards never came over there, and they had constant access to the facilities. Often, if a prisoner was stuck digging trenches or an outside job, they would be the first to be executed or sent to death. This was due to them not digging fast enough, their shoes getting stuck in mud, causing foot sores that later led to infection, or death from the temperature. Other jobs on this camp included the sorting of Canada. Here, prisoners would sort belongings that were taken from other prisoners, and if they didn't make quota that day for a certain thing the Nazi guards wanted, they would either be extremely, extremely punished or executed. Birkenau was mainly known for the camp of the gas chambers. These gas chambers were actually disguised as sanitation facilities. Guards would gather prisoners, tell them they were getting sanitized, and lead them into changing rooms. In the changing rooms, they were ordered to strip themselves and hang their clothes on a hook. They were then told to remember this hook because they would be able to get their belongings. They never got those belongings. They were then handed bars of soap and pushed into a room full of shower heads. Prisoners were suffocated by gas leaking through these shower heads. The gas took 15 minutes to kill these prisoners. 15 minutes. 15 minutes of helpless prisoners screaming, climbing, trying to get out, and gasping for air. Then it was over. Other prisoners were then forced to gather the bodies and cremate them. The ashes were then dumped along the campgrounds. And I don't know if you remember those trenches I mentioned early that prisoners were digging. Those were, those were used for bodies that could not be cremated. Bodies were thrown in these trenches and then set on fire for other prisoners to see. Now, not all parts of Birkenau are intact. During the Soviet liberation, death chambers, living quarters, and other blocks were destroyed in hopes of covering up their heinous crimes. You can still see the remains of these buildings today along with the crematorium one's reconstruction. The whole, hardest part of this whole experience was seeing how forgotten the history was. As we walked block to block and discussed discuss the grim details of each building, I realize the knowledge we lack here at home. Everyone knows the Jewish were killed during the Holocaust, but did you know some of them were Catholic, Christian, or gypsies? Or did you know children were used for genetic testings for diseases or eye color changes? These are facts that are not discussed enough, and as I stand here discussing these history facts, I curr it's currently repeating itself. The Ukraine and Russian war is still happening, yet we are not talking about it enough. It saddens my heart to know we have come so far as a society only to take two steps back into where we were. I hope this presentation my peers and I have presented to you awakens your curiosity in the tragic history of the Holocaust, as well as encourage you to help prevent it from happening again. Thank you. Hello, my name is Caden Sari Hart. I'm a music performance major at AC, and I was one of the few who initially decided they were not going to go to Poland. A few weeks before, the, the war between Ukraine and Russia had broken out, and a part of me was afraid that I couldn't trust a dictator on the other side of the world to keep me safe and my family safe. And a part of me thought, it would be insensitive to go during a time of such tragedy. A few days before, I talked to my father who was going on the trip with me, and he blatantly told me I will be going. <laughs> I did not get a decision, but I didn't realize how important that was till probably the second night we had stayed there. I was nervous on every plane ride, I was nervous landing, I was nervous in the hotel by myself, and I was nervous waking up. Once I got to see the community that was around Poland and how they treated the Ukrainian people who were refugees over there, it was evident to me that this was important not only for me to witness but to learn about and the parallels between Auschwitz, Birkenau, and the Ukraine and Russia war. My first impressions of Auschwitz 
were not what I was expecting. The building seemed put together, at least the two stories ones. The windows were clean. There were clear pathways. There was a sense of community. Walking into the rooms, I was struck with being cold, with being sad, and struck with grief. One of the things we talked about before walking into Auschwitz was identifying with a specific person. Looking at a huge number of people who have passed makes it unreal. It makes it hard to empathize and hard to understand what these people endured. When we walked into one of the rooms, there were children drawings that were imprinted on all the walls. As an artist myself, and someone who did draw when they were a kid, I know that as children, we draw out what we've seen before. And these kids' drawings ranged from many things. It ranged from flowers that were on the ground, buildings that were near them, and hangings and shootings that they had witnessed. We also walked into a room where we got to listen to Holocaust survivors, but also got to see and read some diary entries from various people. I really connected with a 14-year-old girl who had written a diary entry. She spoke of a recent romance she wanted to pursue and where she wanted to take that in the life that she could have, but the uncertainty that was yet to come where she knew it won't happen. As someone who was 14 not too long ago, it, I really empathized. I know what it's like to want something and knowing it may not happen. I know what it's like to love someone so deeply, even though it's young, it's young love and it may not work out. But I have the privilege to stand here and talk about it, whereas she probably passed not too long after. When we went to um, Birkenau, we walked into a room where there were many family portraits. The difference between the portraits at Birkenau and the portraits that were at Auschwitz, the ones at Auschwitz showed survivors and their families after, the ones who got to pursue a family after a tragedy and got to persevere. The ones at Birkenau were f photos that had been taken before, and family that would never get to reunite to again, and family that would never get to hold each other or see those pictures again. They were stripped of any identity they ever had. They were taken family, their family photos were gone, their clothing, their pots and pans, glasses, hair, it was all gone. They all looked the same in order to make them one individual instead of many different. Birkenau had a very open setup. Unlike Auschwitz, where it felt like a community, Birkenau felt cold and barren and scary. One thing that did stand out to me at Birkenau was the, um, the monument that was made for them. On the ground, there were several stones, each one representing a, a person who had passed in the camp. And we were standing on top of them. And I couldn't help but feel like I was disrespecting the grave that these people experienced. I felt that I had the privilege of standing on top of these, and they never got to. They never got to see the monument made for them, and they never got to see what life could have been after. The living conditions for each group were different, but the one that stuck with me were for the children. They, there were many that were stacked on bunk beds, and often the oldest children that could range from maybe three to 12, they were considered the parent. One of these children that got to survive, her name was Lydia Maximovich, and we got to the pleasure of meeting her. She talked about her experience there and what it was like after. When she um, was escaped, not really escaped, but when she was liberated, she was adopted by a family. She would play on the streets with other children, but her idea of playing was not the same. She wanted to reenact what she experienced. She lined them up in a row and pointed at them and decided which one would die. And it really reminded me of the pictures that were at Auschwitz because kids are reenacting what they've seen. Eventually, later on, Lydia's mother, it turned out, had actually survived and they got to reunite. 
It was a huge new cover, news cover, and an incredible story that came out of Auschwitz. But I do think it's important to note that every story that came out of Auschwitz and Birkenau was an important story, and there are millions of them that need to be shared. While at Birkenau, my father pulled aside our tour guide, asking her, what can we do to help Ukraine and help the Ukrainian refugees that we are soon gonna visit? She spoke blatantly that she had been housing a Ukrainian refugee family at the time. It made her question her whole job and her worth and what she had done for the past 12 years. She felt that her work meant nothing to people. If it was only gonna continue again, why continue doing the job that has such a heavy, heavy emotion with it? It made me really think about what can we do to not let this happen ever again? History repeats itself often. It doesn't repeat itself exactly, but it mimics. And there are ways now that we can help. There were many parallels of Ukraine and Russia with the Holocaust, but I think one that I think is very important to note is we have a lot of hope in Poland that I noticed. People were willing to help refugees of all kinds, and we have a lot of hope here in the US that we can offer I was in a privileged position. I was privileged to be able to decide whether I wanted to go to Poland or not. I was privileged to land safely. I was privileged to be with my family. I was privileged to walk into the concentration camps and I was even more privileged to walk out. These experiences are something that have stuck with me since and I will never forget. They have made me a kinder person, made me more empathetic of what people are going through and more aware of what I can do as a small person to help a bigger problem. I encourage everyone here to read any news article, any story, find a Holocaust survivor to read on, connect with them, and carry that with you. These stories need to be told because they're important, and there are stories that are being left untold at this time. I appreciate you for listening to me. Thank you. Hello, let me introduce myself. My name is Justice Smithson and I am a student at Amarillo College and I'm studying to become an elementary school teacher. Before I begin, I would like to express how grateful I am to Amarillo College and all of those involved that made me going on this trip possible. It has forever changed my life, and I am so grateful for that. I have been working in education for the past four years, and one thing that I can say with absolute certainty is that children absorb everything. I'm sure most of you know this if you have children. They hear and see it all, no matter how much you try to not let them see it. Children reflect their feelings and their mental state in their drawings. If a child is happy, they will draw pictures of animals and a shining sun and flowers. The pictures that I see my children draw me, the children I teach, reflects that also. They draw their friends holding hands with them and their houses, their dogs, their pets. They draw crazy dinosaurs that probably didn't exist. The pictures that were drawn by the children in Auschwitz were very similar. They were put into chronological order of before their time and during their time there. As I walked around the room, I noticed that the drawing started out as bright, smiling suns. Dogs, parks, and beautiful, full families holding hands. Then the drawing slowly started to evolve into people that were bleeding, guns, people hanging, and piles of dead bodies. These children viewed the absolute worst of humanity. And their drawings reflected that. And to imagine that these children saw this without their family. Their moms couldn't hug them to make them feel better because their moms were gone, they were dead. These children suffered all alone and I remember hearing a story when we were in Birkenau, visiting the children's where they were held. 
and one of the children, she would close her eyes when the Nazis would come. Because if she can't see, if they can't, she can't see them, they can't see her, they can't get her, her eyes are closed. But they did. They saw her. And they got her. And she's no longer here. It is not hard to compare the current situation happening in Ukraine to what we viewed in Auschwitz and Birkenau. We had the privilege to go and visit a daycare that was set up out of necessity to care for the displaced children, the children whose parents were still in Ukraine, the children whose fathers are there fighting right now, the children whose homes were blown up, whose schools are gone. I spoke to the woman who was running the daycare and she told me that most of these children, their fathers are still in Ukraine. Most of these children are now orphans. The mothers took their children to Poland before it was too late to get out. It is so scary to see history repeat itself. There is a whole new generation of children, a whole new generation that are being displaced, that are in the middle of horrid violence that are parentless. As humans, I just have to ask, how do we allow this to happen? Not just once, but now twice. <laughs> and yet, how do we stop it from happening again and again and again? Thank you all for your time. We are now going to open the program to questions from the audience. Here's how it's going to work, hopefully. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand and Leslie over here will come to you with the microphone and hold it for you while you ask your question. As the student who you direct your question toward, or one of the students, comes up to the microphone and begins to answer, if you are another person who has a question, raise your hand so that Leslie can get to you while the student is answering that first question, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if anybody has any questions right now, please raise your hands. Got one on the corner over here. Okay. And off we go. Hope I can do this. I was fine sitting down and now it's catching me. <laughs> Thank you for going. Thank you for bringing your stories back to us. I'm probably besides the young kids the youngest one here. I didn't learn a lot about World War II growing up uh, with my school, but my question is, is for the second girl uh, over here in the green shirt. Uh, what was the lady's name that you were able to discuss this with? Uh, I'd like to know her name. I apologize, but at the moment, I do not know her name. But I can get your email or phone number, and I can text it to you. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I would like to check her. Thank you again for going. Thank you. Who else? Did someone else have a question? All right. So it's obvious you each went through a life-changing experience while you did this. Unanticipated, you had no idea what it would do to you. How, and this is for any one of you that can answer this for me, how has this changed any of the plans you had before the trip with what you want to do with your life? Who wants it? I think that this has changed how I want to teach. 
um, and where I want to teach. I absolutely loved Poland and I loved the culture. I loved how they honored and respected what had gone on there. Um, they just do it so eloquently and it's, it's heartwarming to see. Um, and so I brought that back with me. I teach differently now with my students. I am a little bit more compassionate. I teach them more about more, it's okay if somebody's different than you because that's not okay to pass on hate. Um, and I now want to go teach in Poland and I think that that would be a really fun experience. So. Yes. Um, I just have a question about one of the pictures that came up if anybody knows about it. Um, it was a picture with, I think, chairs um, outside spread apart. What can y'all tell us about that? Um, if it's the picture I remember, it was one of the uh, monuments that was near, I think, Schindler's factory. Um, and each chair represented someone who didn't survive in the Holocaust. And often, when we saw uh, around certain chairs, there were flowers left for them as a way to remember them and honor them. Um, there was also, I thought it was just really neat to see, but we, there were a lot of butterflies over there, and it was a, a nice symbol of peace for me. I thought it was really beautiful. Any other questions? All right, then. Okay. I, first, I would like to give a big round of applause to our presenters. They all did an amazing job. Uh, this is sadly the last presentation in the Amarillo Public Library's Modern Perspectives on the Holocaust Lecture Series. The library does have one more program this coming Thursday. October 20th at 7 p.m. at our Southwest Branch Library. I hope you will make time to attend. It's a special screening of the Panhandle PBS documentary Witness, which will be followed by a discussion about the film moderated by Karen Welch, the producer and host of the documentary, along with special guest Steve Walton. On behalf of the Amarillo Public Library, I invite you all to join us then. And if you haven't already done so, please be sure to go across the street and visit the Americans and the Holocaust Traveling Exhibition. It's right across the Buchanan from this building. Um, it's going to stay on display now through a week from tomorrow, October 23rd, in the downtown Amarillo Public Library. In the meantime, thank you all for coming. <laughs>